Welcome to the Dr. Bug Deal podcast. Uh, this is a, a very special one for me. Uh, I have a very special guest today, Michael Cofino, who, uh, I mean, I, I would call you an author now, but he's uh, he's got a, a long list of titles, you know, recovered attorney, um, former attorney. Although I have to say, it sounds like you enjoyed being an attorney from, from, from what I gather. Most of my buddies who are attorneys are looking for their, for a way out, except for my, one of my buddies who loves it. But um, Michael <laughs> wrote an amazing book, which I just read. It's called Truth is in the House, uh, which, you know, everyone should read. It's really, really amazing. And we're going to talk about that. But your special place in my heart, Michael was the co-author of my book, Let's Get It, which was just released. So uh, this is, uh, it's awesome. So I, 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 I didn't want to have you on my podcast before you wrote another book because I'd be a narcissist just talking about my book. But <laughs> now we can kill two birds with one stone, man. So thank you so much for spending a, a little bit of time with us this morning. Pleasure, man. And hey, you could always be a narcissist with me. That's cool. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I guess... You know, I'm going to get into all the background and stuff, but I do just really want to talk about your book, Truth is in the House, which I just finished to start with. And okay. sure. um, I guess just to provide a little a little bit of background without giving too much away, because, you know, really, I, I, it wasn't, I'm not just saying this because you're my buddy. I'm saying it because it was really an amazing book. I couldn't put the book down. Um, and it was actually really hard to read because I had a PDF copy, which I was reading from my iPhone. And my wife kept yelling at me. She's like, you know, who are you texting? Who are you talking to? I was like, no, no, I'm reading this book. Like, I can't put this down. It's it's so good. Um, so Truth is in the House, right. basically, it's a, a pan period piece, which basically tracks the lives of two folks. One character is an Irish guy from the Bronx named Jimmy. And another character is a Black guy who grew up in Mississippi. And their lives just keep intersecting, you know, so... Uh, uh, Jalen moved from Mississippi to the Bronx and, you know, they played, he was a basketball player. Jimmy was a basketball player. Uh, their, their paths crossed on the basketball court. And years later, you know, both of them were in Vietnam and their paths crossed multiple times in Vietnam. And after the, after the war, when there were vets, their paths crossed. And then you know, later on in life for their kids, their grandkids were playing basketball, their paths crossed. And it, it's amazing because it's two independent journeys that somehow get intertwined, which is just like the story of life. Um, but it just shows the evolution of these two characters. You know, there's, there's a lot of dark times in both of their lives. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of light too. And there's so many different parts of this book that I'd love to talk about. But I guess before I get into all of that, like, how the hell did you think of all this? <laughs> well, let me tell you how it, how it got uh, germinated because it's... It, I didn't set out to write this book. Um, my first desire was I wanted to write a book about the neighborhood in which I grew up in the Bronx called Highbridge. Because I was so um, enamored of that experience. I wanted to celebrate uh, what it was like for us kids to build our own subculture, to have our own rules and expectations and, and you know, and to fight our wars together in the streets. I mean, I grew up in the streets in Highbridge. Um, and that was my initial motivation. But, I, and I decided, by the way, that I, what I would do is just interview people who grew up in the neighborhood. And I would take these stories and I'd figure out somehow how to thread them together. Um, and so I started with these two guys who I hadn't, literally had not seen in 50 years. Two guys who I connected with on Facebook. And I happened to be in New York uh, visiting family and so I got in touch with them and they came and sat down with me for four hours and they were just incredible storytellers. And they told me about uh, a twin homicide that had occurred in the neighborhood when I was still in the army. And I was blown away by it because I knew two of the kids, the two kids who were killed. I didn't know them well, but I knew them. I played ball with them. I hung out with them a little bit. I was in the bars with them, that kind of thing. Uh, and I just was like, wow. And um and so, and, and the confrontation that gave rise to the homicides was racially infused. It was, it was about, it was a, it was a racial confrontation. And um, I began to research it. I got in touch with the police department. They were really cooperative. They found the cold file. And I saw, so now I had a new theme of race. And then I discovered um, another event that happened not far from the neighborhood that was a gang attack. And that also was about racial turf, a war over racial turf. And I said, okay, I'm doing something else here. And so I, I, I took these two characters in my head, Jimmy O'Farrell, whose family I had emigrate from Ireland to Manhattan initially. 
and then of course the the Jacksons who were trying to make it in the Jim Crow and culture in, in in Mississippi in the 50s and 60s, and they were going to be the metaphors for the journeys. And I didn't really know where I was going to be honest. I knew I had this gang attack that was actual. I knew I had this homicide in my neighborhood that was actual, and I was going to feed off of those actual events and fictionalize them, but I didn't know where else I was going. And so, and I just started building chapter by chapter and that's how the book unfolded. Yeah, it's, it's cool the way you did it because, you know, each chapter is basically, you know, it's, it's Jimmy's story, then it's Jalen's story, the Jimmy's story and Jalen's story. Um, until sort of the end where their stories become so intertwined that it's like, you know, part of the chapter is Jimmy, part of the chapter is, is, is Jalen. But you, so I get the Bronx, I get the Bronx stuff, you know, like I, you grew up in the Bronx, you know, it really, you can feel it. Like you feel like you're living during those periods. Uh, but how did you capture Jalen's story so well? I mean, really, it, it, you know, who did you speak with? How, how did you, cause it, it really is, a, it sounds like a very authentic voice. Thank you. Well, that was actually a tough one. And, and I want to say, you know, I was actually, I wasn't nervous or anxious about it, but I was concerned about being a you know old white guy writing about a black character and writing about race and you know that there was there has been controversy about that subject in the last few years in the literary market you know with the american dirt novel and stuff like that but um i did an enormous amount of research um you know i i, I looked at documentaries uh, i interviewed as many people as i could i interviewed 30 people in total for the book um i read countless books um, I got introduced to um, a relative of Emmett Till. Um, and while I didn't really get to interview that person because they backed out at the last minute, I was able to get footage on the interviews of them and get a sense of what growing up in Mississippi in the 50s and 60s was like. Uh, but it was really about research, but it was more than that, um, Doc. It was I had to get into the sensibilities of their experiences in a way in which, you know, most people will have trouble doing. And I, that was a tough, tough part about it. Um, but it, as the, as I began to develop the Jalen character and the family experience, um, I, you know, it reminded me of people I did grow up with in terms of how they saw the world and what their, their edge was and that sort of thing. Um, and I think that was probably the biggest challenge of the book was, was writing about their story from someone who obviously, you know, most people would say, well, you're a white dude, man. How, where do you get off doing that? And that, and I get that. And I don't, I don't run from that. But I think at the end of the day, um, it was my vision and my voice that I was trying to express from their standpoint. Yeah, I mean, and you did it so well, man. So when, when you were growing up, so did you talk to your, like, you played ball? And I know there was obviously a ton of racism, although, you know, in New York, it wasn't nearly as bad as it was in the Jim Crow South. But even like that one scene in the book where there's that, you know, that turf war in the park, um, there was a lot of, you know, racial turf, you know, and, and whether it was like, you know, blacks and Hispanics protecting their ground or Irish and Italians protecting their turf, you know, everyone had their sort of native turf, you know, which folks, you know, it was very race segregated. Did you talk to your buddies about that back then? Like, if you can look back, like guys you played basketball with and stuff, did, were, were, was it an open conversation that you had with your black friends? That's an interesting question. Let me tell you what it was like, and I'll try and segue to that. Uh, so there was a period of two to three, four years when my neighborhood was completely integrated. And it was really the transition that was happening, I think, in larger in a larger picture in America generally, in terms of neighborhood transformations. And what years was that? That was, um, that was in the kind of mid to late 60s, mid 60s, really. And all, we had, we all, we had, yes, there was, everyone kind of had their own cultures, but we had a common ground and that was the basketball court. And so we didn't really talk about racism per se, um, in the sense that you're saying, but we, but we talked about our lives and how different they were. And, uh, but, and we spent a lot of time with each other outside the basketball court. And I would say it, was, it wasn't always the most comfortable socially because we definitely were coming from different places. 
but we did interact and we did hang together. And it was like a two, three year period before white flight just completely took over. And everybody just thought, everyone who was, was not of color began to leave that neighborhood. Um, and now hybrid is, is, is a, you know, it's not integrated at all. It's, it's, it's black and Hispanic. I went back there a few times over the last decade or so, but um, we didn't really get into the issues of color so much as we talked about our experiences and stories. I mean, some of the guys we played ball with already served time. They already served time, man. They were young, right? Um, so we kind of talked about that kind of stuff, but um, you know, we did have a common ground in basketball and it brought us together. You know, I thought one of the um, one of the, one of the parts of the book that was so moving was, you know, when when Jalen and Jimmy were, you know, they were both recovering, you know, convalescing from from war wounds, um, and you know, Jalen said, you know, Jimmy, you're going to go back as a as a white vet as a hero, you know, I'm going back as a black man, you know, and like the vet status almost was you know erased, you know, and. Um, that didn't come that that really Jalen being a vet really didn't become important again in terms of his identity until he had that mentor at the at the law firm or also maybe the, the attorney that that helped to, to to acquit him but that's a big that's a big I mean that was a big statement man you know that that's what that was truth is in the house right there well you know it's interesting you focus on that because I was talking this, uh, in another interview a few weeks ago, and we were talking about the different emotional journeys of the two men. And Jay, Jay, you know, to some extent, Jimmy was Pollyannish and he was he was idealistic. He wasn't really getting it early on. He was thinking, hey, man, we're good. You know, we're Marines. Everything is good. And Jalen already had the sense because he had been through some heavy stuff. He had seen the worst of it growing up in Mississippi. And he had, and he was sensitized to it, and that was a big issue for him. He he was on a journey to kind of grow beyond that stuff. So he, he saw the world differently. He knew the reality, and he was trying to bring his fr his friend uh, under that umbrella. And um, he knew what was what he what faced him when he got back. And so you know that you know, the the point of that is not simply about them, but about what was going on at the times. Is is Jalen becoming an attorney? Is that true? Is that do you know someone who who kind of lived that life? Yes. Um, well, not exactly that life, but I interviewed a guy. That was, that's a great question uh, because it goes to some of the research I did. So, um, the idea of of where Jalen winds up professionally was nothing I had in mind until I got there. To be perfectly honest with you, um, but all of a sudden it occurred to me: who is Jalen to me as a writer? What's my relationship with him? And what do I think of him? And wh what do I think about his potential? And when I figured that out, I researched and I found this guy who was, um, who was, who was a gang member for a long time in Los Angeles. And he, he, had, this, he had a sim similar sort of epiphany, like you know, in terms of his, his life and what he should do. And he wound up being a lawyer and uh, he, he, had, he had to conquer the hurdles that anyone with a record has to conquer to try and get accepted into the legal profession. And I interviewed him and he was great and he was very helpful and he gave him materials and pointed me in directions. And so, yeah, so there, there are people like that. I also read about another guy who had, a, who was more like Jalen than this guy that I interviewed who had, uh, the other guy I interviewed was Hispanic. The other guy was, was, was African-American and, um, his story was spot on Jalen's. I couldn't believe this. Oh my God, this guy. Did. And I saw, so I reached out to him. Uh, he was a published author, but he never got back to me, uh, uh, which is, which is, which is common in this thing. You know, you, yeah. you, you try and, I mean, there's a lot of people I, I reached out so they didn't get back to me, but um, his story, but his story was reported in the New York times. Mm -hmm. And so I had the inspiration for it. And, and so that's how, it, that's how it came to me. Were you able to speak to any of his mentors or like, no. No. no, no. Yeah, I thought that was such a cool story. I mean, there's so many layers to this book. Um, I mean, it really just makes you think a lot about our own journeys and how, you know, at, at the end, I mean, I don't want to give it all away, but it's just hard not to talk about it because it's, it's so present on my mind. But, you know, th there's a reconciliation that kind of happens at the end when both of these guys, I mean, they must be in their 70s or close to yeah. that, right yeah, they're, at that point. They're, 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 these, just so you know, um, both of these guys are my peers chronologically. Okay. 
How old are you? 72. A young 72. Thank you. um, so, yeah, and, and one of the things that, that Jimmy says, or a revelation that he has, I don't know if he says this, is that our journey in life is like ever evolving. Like it just, it never ends. It's not like you're done at a certain period. Like there's so many like points, like when Jimmy goes to that Vietnam wall in Westchester or, or whatever that is, you know, upstate somewhere near Poughkeepsie. Yeah. And like, he just randomly runs into someone just like, you know, a nurse that was not maybe, maybe probably took care of him when he was on that, on that warship, on that, on the hospital ship. Right. But it's, it's uh, there's so many like points of evolution, even in his seventies, like there's revelations that he's having and really becoming more comfortable in his own skin and reconciling tragic events of his past, you know, literally things that happened 60 years ago. And, you know, trying to come to terms with that. Like he doesn't go visit the gravesite of his buddy that was murdered in the Bronx until like 50 years after the fact, you know, it's, it's, it's so deep, man. It just really makes you think about your, I mean, it really made me think a lot about my own life. Well, you know, the, the scene in Newburgh up by Poughkeepsie um, is an actual scene that um, one of the things that I did when I decided to make both these guys Marines, uh, was interview a lot of Marines. And so I interviewed several Marines and one Marine, I had a really heavy interview with him. Um, he was an amputee and he had fought in the Tet Offensive. And I was trying to get it. I had a lot of materials on the Tet Offensive that there's so many things you could read and look on about that. It's, it's no big secret what went down there. Um, but I wanted to get a bird's eye view. And so I, I found him, I was introduced to him through someone else. And he, in the middle of the interview, um, stopped talking. It's about two thirds of the way through, maybe about 40 minutes in. And I said, you okay? He goes, no, 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 I need a moment. And then he started to cry. And he said, I can't believe this. I thought I was past this. And it was really heavy. And so we continued for a few minutes, then we terminated and we, we, and we booked again um, because we hadn't, I hadn't finished what I wanted to ask him. And we got back on the phone a couple of days later, he was, he was better. And he told me about this experience he had visiting the, the Vietnam, the, the wall, the traveling wall. And he had run into a nurse who had been on the USS sanctuary with him. Uh, at the same time and she was wearing that hat in the book you know the book that yeah, yeah, she, yeah. She, she was wearing that hat i mean i made it different colors and stuff but mm. she was wearing that hat and the one line that is actual from him the scene i recreated but the one line that is actual for him is her statement this is goes to your point about our journey i knew i'd meet one of my boys eventually here yeah and when he told me that, I, I, almost, I almost lost it. And then at the end, he said, do me a favor. I know your book's not about Vietnam. I know your book's not about the military. I know it's part of the journey of these two men you're writing about. But do me one favor, please. He said, please honor the nurses. And so I put the scene in the book. And I wasn't really quite sure how to get to it until I thought about your point about Jimmy's journey. And, I, and, and how it, it needed to be, it, it needed a sort of somebody to cross his path again to, to help him see things more clearly. Yeah. And, and, she's, and she was the metaphor, for, she was the sort of the vehicle for that. Yeah, that was a really heavy scene, man. In the book, it was really heavy. It's funny, like towards the end of the book, when uh, Jimmy and Jalen are just, you know, they meet up in the, in the coffee shop and they're talking, you know, I, I, it was, I was actually in tears while I was reading that part. Wow. Last night. Yeah, it was real, real heavy, man. You yeah. know, just going back to the Vietnam stuff. Um, sure. I, I love like Vietnam movies. You know, it was just such a crazy period. You know, so, you know, all, all, all of like, you know, there's just a bunch of great movies, a bunch of great stuff made around Vietnam because it was just such a crazy time in the world. You, you captured that so well. I actually learned a lot about Vietnam, just how it kind of like escalated up and you know, the public really wasn't aware of what was going on initially, you know, like you guys were just playing hoops and weren't really thinking about it. And then all of a sudden it became like, holy shit, I might get drafted to go to this war. And then people were drafted and were sent there. And, and uh, or like folks would just enlist because it was like a way out for them or like they saw it as an opportunity to escape, you know, be, like, you know, how Jalen, you know, joined the Marines because he thought, oh, you know, it's uh, this place where it's like this ecumenical universe in the Marines and, you know, we're all equals and stuff. 
Um, but that, that was cool, man. I thought that was, that must've taken a lot of work. Well, thank you for observing that. And I'm going to tell you why I'm thanking you because I'm really proud of that, that what I did with the book. And one of the things that I, you know, people ask me, what's the, what's the thing you're most proud of? And this is it, um, is taking all these different events. So, some I've created. I mean, there are, there are episodes in that book where I, did, I just made those whole cloths. But a lot of them are, are historical events that I fictionalized, and a lot of them aren't even fictionalized as the ones you're talking about. And I tr and weaving them together in a single narrative is trying to take all these different things that you know it wasn't like you know the, the gang thing didn't happen to Jalen and 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 the, the, you know all that kind of thing. Um, and there's some autobiographical scenes in there, but that but, but building up the Vietnam escalation while the while the characters are evolving was a really interesting challenge writing, but it, it, it worked, you know, because, you know, as and I, that's all, all that stuff you see in there about the quotes from the presidents and, and the politicians and the military brass and the statistics and the actual battles, all that, so that's real. None of that's fictionalized. Uh, I mean, some of the places are fictionalized like Camp, Camp Cunit and Camp Dalton, those I made up, but um, that's the other thing, by the way, Throughout the book are all on the names I use in the book. For the most part, are people I know. Oh, that's like, cool. Yeah, you know, like so. For example, you know, Jackson, Jalen Jack Jackson. Uh, what uh, there was a Jackson kid I grew up with in the Bronx um, who I played ball with, who was a star at, at Monroe High School. His name oh, was nice. his name was Charlie Jackson, and Charlie could play. Man, Charlie was probably the best player of us local guys, and that's where the Jackson and the Monroe connection comes in. You know, so there's a lot of stuff like that. All my friends, for example, you know, uh, Captain this, Lieutenant that. The last names are friends of mine. Uh, that's cool. That's yeah. awesome. Was anyone like, oh man, why'd you make me that character? <laughs> like, no, why'd you make me the asshole in the book? <laughs> no, no, actually, a couple people wrote me and said, thanks for making me famous, if only for a moment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. that's great, man. Um, so what were, if you don't mind telling me, what are some of the autobiographical parts of the book? Sure, I don't mind telling you at all. Um, well, first of all, my dad, before, before he became a, a, a guy in construction, he worked at Penn Station. And he, and he got me a job for two, two years in a row when I was in high school, um, at, the, at a newsstand in Penn Station. And I used to work, you know, the stand while the Long Island traffic was coming, you know, people coming from Manhattan to go to Long Island to get their paper to go home. And there, there's a couple of scenes where that happens. And there's a couple of Penn Station scenes, as you'll recall. So that's autobiographical in that sense. Um, the, the, the game, quoted the game, that chapter where there's a scrimmage between the neighborhoods where Jimmy mm -hmm. and Jalen first meet. Yeah. Well, not first meet, but they, but they arranged that game. That's a game I arranged in the neighborhood. I actually arranged a name between a game between our neighborhood, which at that time was just starting to integrate, and another neighborhood from a guy from high school who's a good friend of mine is a Puerto Rican neighborhood. And so they brought their, their, their guys and we brought our guys and we had this Sunday event. That's autobiographical. Dropping out of um, CCNY, playing basketball. I played basketball at CCNY. I got kicked out of school, got a job at Walston and Company on Wall Street, and got drafted. That's 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 in the book. Oh wow, that's in the book. Um, it's a little it's a little fictionalized, but that but that's in the book. Um, so there were there were things like that that occurred that um, are were relevant to my background, but there's not a lot of it in there. And you wouldn't, if, unless you know me, you'd never know mm -hmm. what they were. Yeah. I, was, I, I mean, this, this, so I, I can keep diving into like different parts of this book, man. It's uh, I'm really it, impressed by, by the way, with, with how much recall you have. No, it was, it was heavy, man. It was really, it's like, there's, a, there's just so many cool, cool parts of it. You know, I think one of the things and you know, we're all trying to like fill a void, I think with the things that we do in life. So, you know, Jimmy, his buddy, got beat up you know jimmy's buddy got beat up by this gang in the park and he ended up passing away and um you know for his whole life jimmy was feeling this guilt you know like he wasn't stepping up for his boy and you know this really became it was a it was a pervasive three and throughout the book like you know when he was in vietnam you know just jumping in to save somebody or why he didn't jump in to save somebody and you know why other people were able to do this and his whole career as a firefighter like when he has that revelation that holy shit, this is what I've been chasing the whole time. Right. Um, 
I think there's so much of that in all of our lives. I mean, I started thinking about my life and, you know, I'm trying to figure out what, what I'm chasing, but, um, but really it was really, it's so amazing how these events in our childhood shape our entire lives in some way, you know, and, you know, we kind of dance around it, but really it's a, it really is a heavy, deep thing. And, and, and I, I, um, I don't know how you captured the psychology of that so well. Like it was, I was so impressed by that. Well, that's interesting. I, I will say two things to that. Um, one is I, I always believe that, 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 that you know, there's, there's stuff that shapes us early. We don't really know it. It's, you know, well, most of us never figure it out. Um, some of us figure it out. Jimmy figures it out late. He has, remember, he has that rescue scene mm -hmm. where he connects with that kid who's, who falls yeah, on, the, the fence. on the fence. Yeah. That's an actual story, by the way, I found oh, on wow. searching. Yeah. I couldn't believe when I read that. I said, oh my God. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to make, make, how do I make that scene relevant? Um, so I gave him a certain role in that, that incident where he, he has his epiphany. That was his aha I, moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, and Jalen has his aha moment in the courtroom when he's kibitzing with the, uh, the yeah. prosecution and his client gets pissed off. Yeah, like, why are you talking and to the enemy? He, he, at the, that guy's trying to put me away. He's no friend of mine. And that's an actual story too. And this is interesting. I hope this is not too much of a divergence, but when I was practicing law, uh, at, you know, when I was really in my prime, there was a local lawyer here uh, who wrote an article about, about being a criminal defendant. He got actually indicted. He was a popular, successful trial lawyer in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he got indicted and he got ultimately acquitted. And he he wrote, it was a big, big deal. It was in all the papers and stuff. And he wrote an article in one of the legal magazines about his experience. And one of the things that always stayed with me, this is like 30 years ago, I remember this came to me. He wrote about how, you know, lawyers pride themselves on their emotional detachment, like doctors like doctors right okay but he said that's ass backwards you need to connect with your client you need to see the world from your client's eyes you need to become your client's voice you, you need the detachment to do your job well but that's that's only part of it and so Jalen so that so he wrote this article and I never forgot it and I said oh my god that's a perfect aha moment for 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 Jalen so that got in there but the other thing I mentioned I think you know this. My partner is a life coach. And she just wrote a book called Bigger, Better, Braver. I'm not trying to promote her, but and one of the things that she works on is shadow beliefs. That that things that happen in childhood that we we create a meet, we attach a meaning to. We don't quite know what that what the meaning is necessarily, but it it dictates our operating system for a long time. And they and we all have them in our backgrounds. And so you you probably don't remember this detail. If you do, I'll be really impressed. But there's a reference to shadow beliefs. You mentioned shadow list. beliefs in the book. I totally Very, remember that. I was going to. Oh, I was about yeah. to tell you. It's like I, re, I remember that part where you mentioned shadow beliefs, like in, in yeah, it's towards the end of very towards oh the very end. Oh I'm really impressed. <laughs> anyway, so so there's that, and so that was, and I and that that mentioned that came to me late, but but um, but I did but I did want to have and and you know we were you and I when we worked together we talked about aha and, and epiphany and this and that. You had your own. We you talked know, about, about detachment. We talked about detachment too, about how yeah. I, I practice medicine in a very non-detached way. Like exactly. I try to become immersed. Exactly. Yeah. So you were an inspiration for some of this stuff too. And I had that, well, not to go too far down that path, although I'm happy to. When we work together, um, and I think I told you this, but I tell this to everybody who I talk to about the book is, it was personally revealing to me, not just professionally satisfying, to go through your perspective on empowerment, because I kept challenging myself internally. I didn't, I didn't reveal that too much in the work and working with you, but it, I was learning about myself. And so when I wrote this book, I had that, I had that in mind. And I think, you know, I was really satisfied that the two aha moments with these guys are perfectly timed and, and, and appropriate to where they are in their lives. Yeah, that was, uh, that was, both of those were, were amazing. And, and both of those were like, all right, those aha moments, okay, I'm going to retire from what I'm doing, basically. And for Jimmy, it was like, okay, I'm going to focus on my family. You know, his mom was, I think she had passed away around the same time. And he was, you know, or soon thereafter. And, you know, he, but yeah, right, yeah, and he was wanted to focus on his family. And then right. it's Jalen right. realized that, hey, like, this is kind of bullshit what I'm doing. Like, I really want to like serve the community. And then he ended up working as like, you know, in the 
as a you know helping folks out in as a lawyer rather yeah, than working in corporate interest. law. Yeah, more right, public yeah. interest stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which was which was really cool. Um, and that's, that's, funny, that's you, yeah. Okay, so go ahead. No, you, you go. You go, man. I was just going to say that's why Jimmy winds up at the cemetery. Yeah. To see. The, yeah. Right. It was right after that. It was right after right. that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So amazing, man. So just a couple of logistical things because uh, yeah. I don't want to give away too much of the book, but again, everyone should read this book. And I think I, I texted you when I was reading. I was like, this book needs to be a movie. You know, it's uh, I can already play Ed Burns is the Jimmy character. You get uh, Will Smith to play Jalen. It'll be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely I think I mentioned to you quickly in text message that I am studying uh, the art of, of screenwriting and it'll be a while, but um, that's going to be my first. I'm going to my current intention is to transform the book into a screenplay. If for no other reason then I want to start writing screenplays and that's a perfect segue to do it with my own. Book. Yeah. I think this book would play would be amazing on the big screen or maybe as a Netflix, you know, like six part series yeah. or something like yeah. that. Um, all right. A couple of things. What is how long did it take you to write this book? Well, it wasn't the only thing I was doing. Um, so keep that in mind. But, you know, basically a year. OK, so that's not a long time. That's not a long time, actually. I know you have a bunch of other projects going on all the time, you know. Uh, very yeah, I'm a pretty, you know, I, I, I'm at the risk of, you know, self-centeredness. I mean, I'm pretty prolific. I, I really can generate output in a quick time. And that, that I don't rush anything. Don't get me wrong. I went through an amazing number of iterations. But uh, once I get rolling on something, uh, I, I can get it done. And, you know, and I was really, I, I, once I figured out where I was going, which I, like I said, organically, it was organic to a large extent. I was on a roll. I was on a roll. And um, every day, like you said, you pointed out, you know, the, you know, I didn't, by the way, the first several drafts didn't have the same structure. It wasn't, it wasn't um, Jimmy, Jalen, Jimmy, Jalen, the chapters. That was, that came later. Um, uh, when I read another book that did it, I said, oh my God, I love this structure. Will it work for me? And so I took, the, I had the first 16 chapters and I flipped the, I flipped them that way. And um, that was a major move. And I was so happy with to do it that way. Because I just thought it was good for the reader to kind of go back and forth. I didn't think it was confusing, although that was a concern. But the, this, the experiences between the two men and their families are so distinct yeah. uh, that it worked fine. But it, it took was, me about it, a year, about a year. Uh, that's I'm, I'm impressed man that's pretty that's because it's a it's it's you, it's a pretty serious piece of work and you know it's also pretty long um so i'm I'm impressed that you're able to do that in a year you know just to kind of speak to your point you know this alternating of the chapters it's so each chapter is so detailed that you almost lose yourself in the chapter and then you forget and, and it, it reads so well because you become so engrossed in jalen's story or Jimmy's story, it gets like left with a little sort of cliffhanger at the end, or like, you know, what's going to happen next, but then you immediately get immersed in this other person's story. Um, and, and it's, uh, you have to kind of remind yourself, oh, yeah, that's what happened, right, right. That's what happened with Jimmy in the, in the last chapter, but it reads perfectly well. And then at the end, it's the coolest thing, where it's, you know, really, it's kind of like they're both of their lives happening simultaneously. And it just all kind of ties together so well. So it, it, it's not confusing at all, it reads perfectly. I thought, I thought it worked amazingly well. Um, Second question I have for you is: Do you use a thesaurus when you're when you're writing this book? Ah, <laughs> great question! I've never heard that question. I do. I use. Let me tell you. The answer is yes. Let me explain. Um, I use the th thesaurus for for two reasons. One is I use it if um, I, I feel I, I. Let me back up a little bit. One of the reviews of the book, which was which was critical of of, of the book a little bit. Uh, it wasn't a compliment. I don't, I don't think she meant it as a compliment. She referred to the language sometimes as erudite, scholarly. And that's actually part of my writing style. It's not entirely my writing style, but, it, but I, I, I do have a pretty good vocabulary and I like imagery and that kind of thing. So every now and then I might, I might look at a word and say, you know, I like that word, but I think readers might not like it. So I'll, I'll use the thesaurus for that. I need, a, I need a better word to say the same thing that is, people are going to tie into more easily. But there's another book, and I didn't, I just discovered this about two years ago. I, I don't know if this is the right title, but the subject of it is emotional thesaurus, which basically I used 
when I'm trying to create a mode of power in a scene or a dialogue, and I'm not quite sure the words I need for it, I go to this book and it's got, it, it, it's all about different words that, that evoke emotion or different attitude or you know, internal reaction. So I use that, which is not your generic Webster thesaurus. It's, it's very specific to emotion and you know, kind of evocative feelings. So yeah, I do use it. Um, and I do it, you know, one to improve my writing and one to reach readers more effectively. Oh, you got to text me that the name of that book. The, sure, the book. definitely. So I, the reason why I ask is I, I couldn't disagree with that critical review more uh, because what I was going to say is, you know, you use these like $10 words, but in the most like unassuming way. So the, the, the writing is very, very clear. It's very, anyone like, you know, my 12 year old, who's actually a very good reader, he's a strong reader, but I'm going to have him read this book. He'd love it. You know, he's the words aren't used in, um, an intimidating way, but I did look up a lot of words while I was reading this book. The cool thing about reading on your iPhone or Kindle is, or, or like, you know, you can just double tap the word and then the definition pops up, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, so it's cool, like I learned a lot of words, but I, but I would, what impressed me so much was, it wasn't like, sometimes you read shit and it's like, oh man, this person's just trying to show me how fucking smart they are. And like, it's annoying because I have to look up every other fucking word. This was like, you just, you drop a word on a page. I was like, oh, that's a cool word. Like, what is that? Like, you know, that, and, uh, uh, and you can also figure out what the word means by what's around it. But I just wanted to know the precise definition of a word, uh, which I love. Well, let me comment on that, if you don't mind. Uh, let me tell you about my aha moment on this subject. Um, as you know, I've published a number of books on sports and because of my basketball coaching background. And the, um, the first book I, I, I wrote which was on um, strategy, situational basketball. I was working with my brother, who's a professional coach. And he, we were actually in England together. He was coaching a professional team in England. I went to visit him while I was still working on the content. And um, he, would look, he would review my, my, my drafts and my manuscript and he would comment. And we were sitting at lunch and he was giving me input on the, the manuscript and he said, he said, Michael, there's not a coach in the universe that knows what this word means. He goes, you got to stop with the $20 words. And it was like, oh, my God, he's so right about that. And so from that point on, I've been as much as I can self-critical, but I also didn't want to impinge on my writing style because as you as thank you for pointing that out and saying that because it, the work, it, it's OK to send the reader to a dictionary every now and then. Yeah. You know, I think I don't know who it was. Oh, I wish I could remember the guy's name now. It could have been could have been Faulkner. Could have been Faulkner. But hit, somebody will Google this and correct me if it's not Faulkner. But his criticism of Ernest Hemingway was Hemingway has never written a book that sent a reader to the dictionary, <laughs> because Hemingway's style was just so simplistic, which I which I also like by the way. Yeah. I love reading stuff. But I, you know, I don't mind sending readers to the dictionary. I used to want to do it every page, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I loved it, man. I lo that, that, that's such a, yeah. I, as I was reading the book, I was like, oh man, I got to ask Michael about this, you know, because uh, I, I, thought, I thought it was great. I thought your use of the $20 words was very appropriate. Thank you, And, and it Appreciate stimulated that. me. It stimulated Thank me you. to learn more. Sure. Um, so just going as just a matter of, just one last question about the book though. Do Jimmy yeah. and Jalen in your mind ever meet again after that last, coffee shop uh, <laughs> i don't know if i should answer that question let me ask let me ask the doc what does the doc think i don't think they ever meet again i think they stay in touch though we we'll check in every now and then you know it's an interesting question for another reason they're they're too old i something i was talking to my partner about this about a month ago to have a sequel um and i was thinking is, is this the kind of book that could have a sequel um, I was thinking, well, maybe if I had ended it earlier in their lives, maybe, um, or maybe, or maybe I could have a sequel about their, about the granddaughters. Yeah. Dominique and yeah. Dominique and yeah. Aiken. Yeah. That yeah. kind of thing. Um, but I, I purposely left that ambiguous. So I, I, if you, without meaning to be disrespectful, I want readers to think, I, 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 I'm, 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 I like your reaction. I hope someone, I'm having a book event, two book events coming up. I'm hoping someone asked me that question. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's, you know, it just left, it left me thinking about a lot. Um, I mean, but, God, you, so but, many but, 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 but do you remember, remember the, what's the last moment that Jalen, what's he do when he crosses the street? 
thumbs up, man. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So what does that mean? I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Jalen comes across as this cool dude with a lot of swagger. Yeah. And even yeah, Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy does acknowledge that, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so that just seemed so appropriate, you know, like it was just so yeah. smooth, you know. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> it just, well, I guess I, I, keep, I keep saying this is the last thing about the book, but. Please. What, what, one of the parts that I thought was amazing was the attorneys that mentored Jalen. So basically after like Jalen was acquitted from, you know, the, the double homicide situation, the attorneys that were representing him took him under their wing and he was working as a paralegal in that firm. Mm -hmm. And there was something about him. Like he had like, just, he was, he was wise. He had a lot of street smarts. He could sort of dissect a situation um, in a way that these attorneys couldn't like, you know, he kind of saw the real deal. Hey, you know what? Like in one of the scenes, it's like, Hey, they asked Jalen, what do you think? And he's like, well, I think they just, the two parties just need, he just wants to hear an apology and that resolved the issue like in a lot easier way than going through like legal, you know, back right, and forth. Right, right, right. And then eventually like, you know, they get, they work with Jalen so he could go, he becomes a lawyer and, you know, he has a great career as a lawyer. And, and then like later on in the book, he gives this, he's giving us a lecture at like some very, you know, renowned law meeting. And he runs into one of the partners of the firm and he asked about his mentor, you know, his main mentor, and his mentor had just passed away. And, you know, in Jalen, like, you know, his heart drops with some, he's like, oh, shit, I never really got to thank him for how much he changed my life. Although I'm sure his mentor knew that. And, you know, they just seemed like a really good group of guys that they were looking out for his mom and, you know, all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. as well. Um, but that had really had me thinking, you know, like, it really is so important to recognize folks. And we talk about this in my book also, but who have impacted you along the way and who have really kind of altered the trajectory of your life in some very positive way. And it's important for folks to know that. Yeah, well, you talk about that in your book. Yeah. About, you know, people sometimes shy away from help and help. We all need help. We all need mentors. We all need people who can show us the way. We don't always have to agree with them. We don't always have to embrace their advice. Um, you know, that, that both Jimmy and Jalen have it. That's another, I guess that, I, I don't know if you would call it another aha moment, but it's, but they do have the pangs. They suffer the pangs of not, not have, not wanting to regret. And that's sort of a, that, that begins to lay the groundwork for their interaction later on is, you know, um, Jalen beats himself up a little bit for never reaching out enough to his mentor. Now the guy is dead um, and he can't, you know, it's like, I feel the same way about like my parents have been long gone. You know, it's like, did, you know, did I make, you know, did, did I do all the right stuff? Did I fail to, you know, spend enough time with them and that sort of thing. And then for Jimmy, um, he, he has, he has the same, you know, he, he has the same reality. He's trying he's to with his dad. Like, you know, he talks yeah. about how, like, yeah. I tell my dad how great of a dad he was. Or, yeah. You know, and, like, and, 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 all, and, and, and he goes through this list. I, now I have my bucket list kind of thing. Right. So both, both the characters have another, it's not so much an aha moment as a nagging feeling that that they've made mistakes and not maybe doing the right thing to, with people who are now they can't deal with because they're gone, right? So we all have that. We're all going to have regrets. Oh, I wish I had spent more time with my dad. I wish I'd you know I'd said two more things that, about you know how I feel about my dad or my mom or whatever it is. And both the characters, after they you know when Jalen loses his mentor. And, and, and Jimmy loses his parents, his dad in particular, he starts to feel that way. And, but they, and they begin, and, and that feeling of regret, which is not a comfortable place to be for any of us, because it's sort of like something you can't really fix other than moving on from, um, begins to drive, or lay the groundwork for what happens later in the book. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, everything sounds, sounds kind of ties itself up at the end, you know. Like Jimmy spends a lot more time with his mom after his right, dad passes right, away. And right, she becomes right. a bigger part of his life. And you know, and Jalen's always looking out for his mom. Right. Um right. Yeah. yeah. There's a yeah, lot of family, yeah. there's a lot of family in the stuff in the book. One of the reviewers, it's interesting how people react to the book, you know, which by the way, apart from the content about, you know, that I write a little too scholarly. <laughs> Uh, apart from that comment, you know, the book's been been received with great positive uh, reaction. So that's been good. But, but you know, one person, actually the same person who, con who commented about the language, she was really moved by the family components of the book. I was like, wow, that's interesting. 
um, I mean, they're there. Uh, it wasn't really my main focus, but yeah, but it's there. And and um, and I think that you know, and I reread the book again recently because of getting ready for these book events and um, the importance of connection. This is and this is something that you talk about in your book a little bit um, with your patients is connection and empathy and understanding people better. And this is we're in a time now. And I don't mean to get on my soapbox. Forgive me. A little here, but we're at a time when we need more than ever to connect with people's humanity, and um, that's kind of like I'm really curious about. What, you know, you need to ask me this question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. <laughs> Is I've been asked a few times, what do you want readers to come away with? And the first time I got the question, I hadn't really thought about that much, and I said, so I answered this way, and I've been answering that this way ever since, which is self introspection. Look at your lives a little more carefully. Be honest with who you are. Um, be honest with who you are about race. It's okay to have racial bias. I mean, it's not a good thing, but it's not, it doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you someone who's been impacted by culture. You could do something about it, uh, be, but be honest about it first. Try to connect with people better. Try to understand their pain, how they see the world. You don't have to love them, but empathy is something that we're in dire need of. And, and like I said, you talk about it in your book and, 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 I, and in a really great way with your patients. I love what you did there. And so that's the kind of message ultimately I hope people take from the book. Yeah, man, I definitely, I definitely felt that, man. You know, it made me a lot more introspective for sure. I can't, I can't imagine anyone reading this book without taking a look within and saying, hey, you know. Yeah, I hope that's it, And also like family is very complicated. You know, like family dynamics are, are it's, it's, there's so many layers of emotion there, which you also capture so well. Um, you know, Jalen's brother, Jumanji is, is, you know, he gets beat up when he's a kid and he was a good basketball player, but then he couldn't play anymore. And then he just kind of fell into the darkness of drugs, which also made consumed him. Um, and, you know, it's like that, you could see that in Jalen, like, shit, I wish I could help my brother more. But also part of it is like, how could you be such a fuck up? And like, why can't you get your shit together? Like, it's both of those feelings, you know? And I, that's a heavy I, scene, by the way, that I wrote. I mean, I, I hadn't planned on that scene, but it just came to be where he confronts him. Yeah. The, the, the mirror, the mirror scene. Yeah. Yeah. The mirror scene. Yeah. There's a lot of heavy scenes with, with Jumanji, man. Um, yeah. yeah. He's, he's a hard luck kid. You know, I don't, he's, you know, my brother was a hard luck kid, you know, who I lost, you know, in Vietnam. Um, and that Jumanji isn't, you know, based on my brother, but but that sort of feeling was in my head, you know, is that some people just, their path is littered with, with, with bad luck. And, you know, to some extent, like you say, I think in your book or something like this, that we make our own luck, you know, to some extent. And we, we wind, I think the phrase is something like, we wind up where we're supposed to wind up. Yeah, um, and where you belong. Where you belong kind of thing. But we are, you know, some people just get dealt some shitty cards. Yeah, and, no, and Jamani got dealt some, some shitty cards. Yeah, and addiction can hit anybody, really. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it happens in all walks of life. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it's interesting. I didn't get into this. It was in by implication, but that you know, when they get to New York and they start going to high school in New York and they're in this integrated school in this new environment, and Jalen is becoming a you know a major stud on the basketball court and turning a program around and becoming famous. You know, within the annals of of you know, you know New York City basketball, and and his older brother, who was a great athlete, can't play because he got attacked in a racial uh, ambush in in Mississippi. And I don't really get into how Jalen's success is impacting his brother's you know transgressions and in this direction, but it's there. Yeah, it's you there. can feel it. I mean, it's it's pretty it's palpable, you know. Yeah, the older yeah. brother and the you know he's the older brother, but the younger brother is sort of like dominating right. socially. Usually, it's the other way around, you know. But the younger yeah. brother's kind of hanging on the big. You know, and I, you know, when I was growing up, I don't mind to get too personal here, but um, you know, I had my brother and I. He was only two years younger, and so he he always wanted to latch on to me. Where he always wanted to go where my boys went, you know, and I was like, you know, go come on, go go. go yeah, go with your friends, you know. And um, it's a complicated story. I haven't really written about it. Uh, that there's some emotion in the book about it. It's pretty subtle, but but you know, it was brothers and how they relate and what their journeys are 
is a pretty complicated thing sometimes. Yeah. No, it really is. Cause you see like the darkness of your household <laughs> together, you know, like you're yeah. experiencing a lot of family shit together, which no one else really knows about, you know, right. and, and no one would ever understand it either. Cause they didn't grow up in your house, you know? Yeah. Right. It's sort of like, no one knows you better than your siblings in terms of in that regard, like about how you grew up, you know, it's a very, very special, unique relationship. Yeah. Sometimes you don't even want, sometimes you don't want to go there, but, uh, right. but you know, um, so just go going back a little bit, just away from the book, uh, yeah. you know, so you, you were a litigator for 40 years. Um, do you like being an attorney, right? Um, I have to give a complicated answer to that. I'm sorry. So um, for most of my legal career, and I would say I'm still, I still practice a little bit. Let me make that clear, but it's mostly, you know, just to keep, the bills getting paid without worrying it because monetizing a writing career is a little complicated as, as you might imagine. Um, so I do a little bit on the side, you know, not a lot. Um, but I did drop out for four years. I, I gave it up because I was, because I was unhappy doing it. But until that started to happen, until I started feeling the call of writing for let's say 30 years, I couldn't wait to get to work. I couldn't wait to be in the office. I loved it. It was such an intellectual challenge to solve complicated legal problems. And I, you know, I was at a law firm that was highly regarded nationally and later internationally, where, you know, um, the best of the best went to, I mean, there are other firms like that, but we were in the, we were in the top echelon. In San Francisco? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, San Francisco and, and Hella Ehrman was its name. And Mm -hmm. when I first got there, I was intimidated. I, mean, I, you know, I was academically accomplished, but I was like, oh my God, these guys are so smart, you know, until I realized that I was as smart as they were, but I also had something that a lot of them didn't bring. I had a sense of the practicality, street smarts call it if you yeah. like, um, that was different. I had an edge. I had a way of, you know, dealing with people and legal problems and, but, you know, by the way, that, that scene in the book where, where Jalen has this intuition about how to solve a case, that's, that's a real, that's another autobiographical moment mm-hmm. um, where I resolved the case when I realized that it wasn't about the money, it was about respect. But that aside, so once I realized that, oh my God, I really belong here and I can operate at the same high level as these guys. Um, and we were, it was a pretty liberal firm in terms of politics and stuff. So I fit in comfortably. Um, I love going to work. I loved it. And, you know, every day was, oh, my God, it's like a can- candy store. What, what legal problems am I going to jump in today and solve? And, or, or what, what brief am I going to write? Or what cases am I going to read? Or what deposition am I going to take? I can't wait to do it. But after 30 years or so, I began to tire. And what I tired of, Doc, was not the content not the intellectual content, but as a, as a litigator and trial attorney is the constant fighting. You know, your, your mode of work is to fight, <laughs> to advocate yeah. is a nicer way to put it, but you're always fighting with people. And that tired me. And so that's when I started to think, I got to get out. I want to write. It took me a while to have the courage to, to jump. Um, it took me a long while. I wasn't, I was in my mid sixties. Yeah, um, but I, and I was coaching basketball too, so I, I left them both, and I have returned to the law, but only on a minor basis. So yeah, unlike most of the, I guess some of your friends or colleagues you talk about, for a long time I was totally smitten with the practice of law. That's interesting. So I have a bunch of my buddies, like my boys from growing up. My best friends are my friends from when I was a kid. You know, uh, from the, on the south shore of Long Island, and almost all of our, well, a bunch of them are attorneys, and. It's funny because one of my buddies, like like my best buddy, is uh, he works for the government. He loves the law. He just loves. He lives and breathes the law. He loves it, you know. And he's always a very academic guy, you know. He was did clerkships and all that sort of stuff. And this is always what he wanted to do. And then, you know, a couple of my other buddies are just kind of going through the motions. They're successful. They're partners in law firms, you know, and they're financially doing very very well. Um, but you know, they're kind of mixed. So you know, I have one friend who loves the business side of law. You know, he loves bringing clients in and he's like great at it you know he's just like a super charming guy and you know he told me once he had an intern then he told the intern he's like listen if you want to learn about like the law i'm not your guy but there's like a million other better lawyers in this firm but if you want to learn how to bring business in 
and how to like entertain clients. You just watch what I do. And he's like brilliant at it, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's an important part of being, you know, of being at a law firm, you know, like yeah. bringing the clients in, you know, bringing the money in basically. You know? rain, rain, they call it making rain. Right. He makes it rain for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so it's interesting. Then I have a few of friends who are attorneys who basically left practicing law and work. Well, they work, they practice law, but they're not working in a firm. They're working in house in a, in a company and, you know, it's a much more palatable lifestyle, I guess, you know, yeah. more nine to five and that sort of stuff. So, I, I was I was always curious about that, you know, about uh, about your career because just from our conversations, it always seemed like you know you were too, you know, when we hung we only met one time in person, but when we did hang out, you were telling me about some crazy stories where you go overseas and were practicing law in like Thailand and you know yeah, yeah I think yeah, it was yeah. Thailand right yeah Thailand yeah. Malaysia a lot of places over there a lot of places yeah, yeah. but you know look it, you know it's, you 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 got your finger on something that's quite complex because it's a it's a complicated profession first of all on the litigation side, which is what I could speak to with authority, you're almost never bored intellectually. Um, you know, cases, even, even, even in areas especially, the facts are always different. You know, the nuances of the legal principles are, are, are you know, always varying. Um, it's hard. You know, it's an advocacy system, advocacy system where people are trying to get outplay you and outplay, you know, and, 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 you know, then there are the subtle things like that's in the book, really being the voice of the client. How do you represent? How do you solve their problems? Um, you know, how do you get an edge? How do you set it up? Um, and then the legal writing part, which I love. And then, you know, take examining witnesses. How fun can that be? Think about it. You know, yeah. one of the things I prided myself was the ability to get information out of witnesses. I mean, I could tell you stories forever. I know we don't have time for that now, but so it's a very complicated, challenging profession. On the other hand, it's draining. It beats you down. It takes a lot of hours. You know, it's, you, you get tired of fighting with people. Um, and, you know, and, and, and so the question always is, why are you doing it? What's your goal? Because a lot of people can have a law degree practice for a while and then use that as a platform for something else. They just don't understand what they're, this is what, you know, we talk a little bit about that in your book. You need to have a game plan, yeah. you know, and get those tiny wins along the way, but um, ha have a long-term game plan. I can, it's a great profession. It's got its problems. It's, you know, it's, it's inaccessible to too many. It's too expensive. It's too complicated. Um, and people are disappointed and the criminal justice system is a whole other subject. That's, you know, um, that's a complicated thing, but, um, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's not for everyone, but it can be incredibly rewarding. And of course it pays well, not yeah. to mention. Yeah. So is that like, you know, when you decided to jump ship, you know, we talked a little bit about when we're texting about this podcast, about the, the concept of changing careers and, yeah. you know, um, you're doing something entirely different than what you've been doing professionally for, you know, for you for, for four decades. Were you at the point where you kind of had like a little bit of fuck you money and you're like, all right, I can just go like now <laughs> be, be a rider now and just coast for a while. Um, boy, you, that's a Pandora's box question, but I'll, 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 I mean, I'll, it's, fuck you money being a relative number. Like, you no, know, no, but, no. So let me, let, I'll get into it a little bit with you. I'm happy. Cause I, I love talking to you as you know. Um, so I screwed up a little bit. I didn't understand. I had, I had a little bit of what you call fuck you money. Um, I had a very big pension, but I got divorced too. And so my financial situation got complicated. So there was that. And, and I didn't, and I was okay. I was still practicing law. I, you know, one of the, indeed, one of the, one of the terms in my marital settlement agreement was ending alimony at a point where I wanted to quit law and get into writing. That was part of the vision, right? And it actually framed part of the agreement. But I didn't understand how challenging it is to monetize a writing career. I get it now, and I'm much more smart about it than I was then. And so I went, I went along my happy way thinking it was just gonna work out, which was really stupid. And got into a situation where I said, like, uh-oh, I need a new game plan um, and I have it. And part of that eventually, not right away, was getting back in the law to have that inside. So um, I acted as if I had a lot of fuck you money, <laughs> but it wasn't necessarily smart long-term planning. 
um, especially at my age, you know, I was you know, when I I think when I went inactive, I was probably 67, 60, something like that. And you know, in you, you, it's so hard to get back in when you're out at that age. I mean, you know, in the law, going back to the other subject, one of the problems with the profession is they kick they kick people out at a certain you know 65 forced retirement or 60 whatever the age is in a particular firm and you know you're you're yesterday's news and they're not particularly sensitive about it it's all about the widgets you know at the end of the day and so you need a long-term plan and i had one i just didn't think it through clearly enough so but now it's good are you doing litigation stuff now a little bit not much you know i mean i you know it's with COVID, you know, the court appearances I've had have been like ours. It's been video. Mm-hmm. Um, people don't try cases that much. I mean, they do try them, but they don't get tried that much. The, the 90% or more or, or more don't get tried. Um, it's basically, I mean, I'll look, I mean, let me step back. I have a philosophy about the practice of law, and it's that lawyers have to be at the end of the day, all the skills wrapped into it, problem solvers. We got to solve problems. And the way to solve a problem typically is consensus, compromise, finding the middle ground and finding it sooner rather than later. And so sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes people throw down the gauntlet. Um, Sometimes people engage in what they call scorched earth tactics. Um, And those tend to be misguided approaches, because what happens is the end of the day, you always wind up in a a, a dialogue. But after what? How much money has been spent? How much anxiety has been incurred and suffered? How much time has the clients and their personnel and staff spent? So I always look early for a way to resolve it. And so, yes, I'm litigating, but um, I consider myself more a problem solver than a litigation attorney, although I could still litigate with the best of them. I have the skills, you know. Um, I just think that there's a better way for clients, generally speaking, generally speaking. Listen, as, as a client, I, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> just yeah. solve this problem as fast as possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or I'm going to talk as fast as I possibly can <laughs> to keep right. the arts down. <laughs> tick tock, tick tock. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that's good stuff, man. Um, so just, you know, not to, again, be narcissistic, but I, please, I, I, please. I do want to talk a little bit about our project together. Um, Absolutely, man. I'm happy to, uh, you know, so for me, you know, I, I, it was an amazing process for me, you know? So I, I, I really view what we did together as like a true collaborative co-writing experience. I don't know if that was your, your experience, but for me, totally, man, totally. it was, and, um, you know, it was just amazing. The whole process to me was incredible. Uh, like I said, you know, I had no idea how to write a book and I was like, shit, I wouldn't definitely going to need help with this in order to get it done within like some sort of timely fashion and just to get it to the finish line. Yeah. So I reached out to Gary V's co-writer and, um, she graciously responded to me and directed her to a website where I put, you know, what I'm looking for, for a co-writer. Um, and I hate the word ghostwriter because that's what the website is called. You know, and I right. guess a lot of people do use pure ghostwriting. Right. Um, right. But again, like for us, I, I, I really felt like it was a lot of like awesome back and forth and, and collaboration. Um, yeah. And I got like a hundred resumes, like a hundred, uh, wow. maybe even more. Um, oh I know God. you read through them and a lot of them you could tell were just kind of like, uh, you know, just a hire a gun type of situation. Where like it just it was it was a uh, it was very uh, like sort of a corporate vibe you know it was like it was it was like a pure business transaction mm. so I did I would just kind of sift through those but you're the you're the first person I talked to and the only person I talked to um, and it, you know, it just felt like a really instant comfort level of connection again we'd never met this was all on the, we had a phone call right. Right. I was driving back from the city we had a phone call and then I think we spoke once like another time after that and then we just said all right let's do this. And uh, the first like couple of weeks, or maybe it was the first, you know, we started in September of 2019. I think we we actually finished the book really fast. Yeah, very um, fast. And you know we kind of laid out a framework, and we just literally talked for hours. And you know, and you know, at that point, just having like that 
bank of of um, content, you know, you you sort of you know, I, gave, I kind of presented what my vision was, what I wanted to talk the book to be about to empower folks. And then, you know, you spent some time. So let me just put together like a table of contents and like sort of an outline of this book. And you did. And then we just started hacking away chapter by chapter. And, you know, I talk about those first few, you know, the m- first month when we were talking to each other, it was like, I've never been in therapy. Like I've never gone to therapy before, <laughs> uh, but I know a lot of my friends have, and it was like therapy, man. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I want to comment because, um, I pride myself on the collaborative dimension to call it ghostwriting experience or co-authorship, whatever you want, because that's when you're going to make the, you're going to generate the best product. Number one, you know, because, um, you know, if I'm just basically writing, you're basically just signing off on stuff, you know, haphazardly, it's not going to get the best out of you. And that we need to be partners in the process. You know, this, the other thing is, was what you pointed about as the therapy part. One of the great things that happened to me in all the memoir writing I've done, the nonfiction work too, where I've done the, the same role is, and I alluded to this earlier, is I get changed personally. Your book in particular was caused so much in self-introspection. It wasn't necessarily that, oh, I've never heard of this idea before, but it was forcing me to think more deeply about it. I still use, I've told you this before, I actually use this with people I know too. I use the phrase "tiny wins," yeah. which you which you came up with. Um, it's such an important part of life, you know. Um, is you know because we we become sort of overwhelmed with the prospects of change because oh my god that mountain looks so damn high, yeah. but it's the time it, it's the small steps, the confidence in that you know the you can measure progress in tiny little increments and that's good. I still talk about that. And, you know, so yeah, working with you was easy. I got to say, I don't know how therapeutic it was, but it was easy because it was collaborative. And, and we got, I thought, you know, in terms of getting the most out of the content and the most out of the personal part of the experience, collaboration is essential. Yeah. And we did, yeah, we did, and, uh, we got, and we got it done quickly. Yeah. We got, we we're done like in the beginning of the pandemic. Then I was like, shit, I had the manuscript. And then I realized that's when the real work begins. Cause I was had the manuscript. I was like, yeah. yes, man, done. And I'm like, Oh, fuck how do i get how do i get this book out and then that, that was the hard part i mean it was all tough but we got it done you know one of the most so you know you're writing a book when, when i was writing the book and i'm sure you feel this way with all the books that you write you're sort of writing it in a vacuum you know so you know writing it and like where you and i are going back and forth and we're fixing stuff up and adding details and removing stuff and you're like is this does this book like resonate is this just all bullshit like am i you know and there's been times where i've like read a chapter like when we were writing the book i'd read the chapter and i'd be like this sucks i was like this is no one's gonna read this shit i was like this is just like you know is it and then sometimes you read like oh man this is really really good but you know one of the most validating parts of this process was and you just actually kind of talked about it but you were going on you were you hike a lot you were on a hike and it was a really really tough hike and like you were kind of losing some steam in the hike and you just kept telling yourself tiny wins one more step one more step and then you text me after and yeah yeah uh, i remember that i remember that yeah yeah and i was like you know what i was like there, maybe there is a little, maybe there is something here you know yeah and i'm getting all i'm getting that kind of feedback you know a lot of it's like hey this is all stuff that we've heard before or, you know it's in the, every self help book is basically the same shit you know yeah but it's how it resonates with the person who's reading it how it tells you know how it can shape them to make a change or I can inspire mm-hmm. them to make a tweak that can maybe get them, you know, towards their goal easier, you know? And that's what the book was really about, man. So I just wanted to thank you for oh, wow. being my co-writer. My pleasure. The other thing about it is the book is, is short. And I didn't know that until I got a copy from you that it was so yeah. tiny. It was, yeah. And it's, it's, that made it such, so accessible. Totally. So accessible to the, to the reading public. I said, and of course, I, I had never told you this, but when I got the cover, well, I, as you know, I responded the way I did very favorably, but I sent it to my two sons and they were like, oh my God, that's the greatest cover they've ever seen. <laughs> they oh, will, yeah, and, and cause they get, cause you know what they saw in it? They saw the attitude in it right away. They saw the edge in it. They, they saw the compelling nature of it. And it was like, they were, they were, they were really great. They were really great. In response. Oh, I love it. Yeah. You know, I went through like three iterations of that. So I kept getting, you know, they send you when you, you've been through with all the books that you've written, they send you a copy of it. And the first right. copy they sent me, 
was like it was too big you know and i was like this sucks then i i re i made another size they sent me that one it was too small <laughs> you know yeah, so yeah. then this one was like just right in between you know and it, it really yeah. it's just it's it makes it is very accessible size you know and that's one of oh. that's a lot of the feedback that i get yeah. um michael so i could i could i could keep you here all day and just bullshit with you but maybe we should take the bullshit over around a couple of rounds of beers you know yeah, <laughs> when, when sure. hopefully we see each other next man well you know i'm just, trying to, i'm trying to do a I, I i've been unsuccessful so far I'm trying to get a book event in New York. Um, I have a, I have one more reach out I'm going to do, and if I get one, and and of course COVID permitting, right? I don't want to I don't want any more remote. I want to, I want another in person one in New York. I'm going to bring out my New York posse, so maybe we, we can combine something in. Oh, uh, you know it, man. You know you know I'm going to be there. Um, yeah. So just just to kind of recap, uh, so sure. listen, everyone who's listening to this podcast must get truth into the house. Uh, I, I, it was, I'm not, this is not just bullshit. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. This is my honest, sincere review. It was one of the best books I've read ever. You know, I really, I just could not put it down. Um, it's just, it, it really is going to make you think about yourself and, you know, it's going to take you into some deep, dark places at times, but it really makes you, you know, really be introspective. And that, and that really is what reading to me is all about. It's about evolving. It's about becoming a better person. It's about pushing yourself uh, out of your comfort zone and you know really taking you to some places where you could grow as a human and this book certainly did that for me and i know it'll do that for anyone who reads it so everyone must read it man thank you doc appreciate that man always um, a pleasure always a pleasure hey man great great seeing you man thank you again so much man for doing this podcast. Right. okay you're welcome so let's get it ciao man let's get it